So I think that the connection between my work and the, the topic of this conference is really user-generated content and how to extract uh, knowledge about people from user-generated content. So what is the type of knowledge that we usually are interested in when we want to extract knowledge about people? So on the one hand, we want to know um, what people think and feel. We want to understand their attitudes, their opinions, their viewpoints. On the other hand, we also want to know what they do, what are their actions, their decisions, their behavior. We also want to understand who they are, which means we want to know their socio-demographic attributes. And we want to understand what is the social, physical, and digital context in which they are embedded. And in empirical social sciences, surveys are really the main instrument uh, that is used for extracting this type of knowledge about people. And survey methodology research really has a long history of identifying and analyzing the various types of errors that can occur in the statistical measurement of beliefs, opinions, viewpoints, behavior. And therefore, I think it's useful to have a look at the conceptual framework that is used uh, nowadays in the social sciences and then think about you know, how can we use a similar conceptual framework when we try to extract knowledge about people from user-generated content. So this is uh, called the Total Survey Error Framework that has been developed by Groves et al. and is the main conceptual framework that is used uh, today. And in this framework, you're basically uh, distinguishing between errors that can occur on a measurement level and on a representation level. So on the measurement level, you first have to define what you're actually trying to learn, what you try to measure. And therefore, you have to define your theoretical construct of interest, which can be something like the political opinion of a person or the attitude of a person towards migrants or towards women or also the personality of a person. After having defined this construct, you usually deduce a set of questions that should help you to measure all aspects that are relevant for the construct. So you have to do some cognitive pretesting of the questions and you have to make sure that the questions are really capturing the different dimensions of the construct. When you have done that, you go to the measurement, so you go to the field, you ask your respondents, uh, your participants to respond, and also during this process, different errors can occur because, for example, interviewers are not well trained or because people will simply lie when they answer your questions because of social desirability biases and similar things. Um, then when you have collected the response, you go to um, you know, do some pre-processing, you automatically or manually label responses, and then you have an edited response. So then you're basically here. But since you want to learn not about one single individual, you have to go to the representation level. So you have to define your target population. So what is actually the population you want to learn something about? And that could be, for example, all women that you know, are allowed to vote in the US. So for your target population, you have to define a sampling frame. And the sampling frame could be something like you know, a voting register, a telephone number register, address lists. And the deviation between this uh, sampling frame here and the target population may cause a coverage error. Then you use the sampling frame, you sample from it. During this process, sampling errors may occur. And then when you have your sample, you approach these people, and a certain fraction will obviously not reply, and therefore you have non-response errors. Then you basically take your respondents, you do some statistical adjustment based on socio-demographics to make sure that, your, um, that, that the demographics of your respondents match the demographics of the target population. And then you end up having a service statistic that tells you something about the political opinion of your target population, for example. And on top of the service statistic, you can give people information about the data collection process. You can describe what design decisions did you make in order to make sure that you avoid this type of er errors at various stages. And I think this is something that is also useful when we think about when we work with uh, social media, so with any type of found data. Because because we also make lots of design decisions, but we are often not very explicit about these uh, design decisions. So, you know, thinking about, for example, measuring um, political opinion based on social media data, we would also need to define at the beginning what is our construct. And if our construct is uh, political opinions, then we have to think about 
which observations do we actually consider as a valid indicator of this construct? So for example, um, is it enough to you know, observe that someone talks positively about certain politicians or certain political parties? Or is it a good indicator if we see that someone shares URLs from uh, media outlets that presumably have a certain bias in one or the other direction? So are these, you know, on a conceptual level, valid indicators for the construct we are interested in? Then in the next step, we actually do the platform selection. And also during this step, um, we actually make the first design decision, which has an impact on our construct. So when we select the platform, we have to be um, explicit about like who are the people that actually self-select them into the platform because the platform restricts our sampling frame. And the deviation between the sampling frame and the target population that we are interested in causes a platform coverage error. But actually, not only on a representation level, but also on a measurement level, the platform choice may lead to errors. Especially when you, know, you are looking at a behavior, you're taking a behavior as an indicator that is impacted by the platform. So thinking again about these examples of people sharing URLs, it might be that the platform um, implements some recommendation algorithms that make some URLs more visible than others. And therefore, we need to be careful to kind of distangle the psychological behavior from the platform driven behavior. Um, then when we start the data collection process, again, we make usually many design choices unless we have access to all data. But when we work with social media, we often you know, start querying the API. We are defining some keywords that you know, presumably capture the construct we are interested in. So if you think, for example, about you know, the SEM evil tasks, which I assume many of you know, um, then they you know, define tasks for stance detection methods. And they start a data collection process by defining a couple of hashtags that people people often use to talk about Trump or to talk about issues like abortion. And if the people that are using hashtags, which is a very small fraction of people, uh, talk differently about these issues than the rest of the population, then this, of course, introduces uh, query coverage errors. Um, after we have done the data collection, we do some pre-processing, detecting of entities, metadata inference, sociodemographic inference, and of course, also here, um, errors can occur. And then in the last step, in the data analysis step, we actually really try to label our responses with respect to the construct we are interested in. And here I think uh, something interesting happens because often we use machine learning methods or data-driven algorithms, and therefore representation errors and measurement errors get connected. So if we, for example, train our stance detection method on the corpus that we collected beforehand, then all biases that occur on this representation level will directly lead to measurement measurement errors and will therefore make our measurement potentially invalid. So in my talk today, I first want to um, talk about a specific representation error, uh, namely the representation error in Wikipedia with respect to gender. And then I want to connect that with one concrete uh, measurement error and discuss how these two things relate and also propose uh, an idea of how we could potentially uh, tackle this issue. So let's assume now the goal is to extract knowledge about notable people. So we want to know what uh, did they um, achieve, why are they notable, what is their relationship with other notable people. And then, of course, uh, a plausible um, platform that we could use is Wikipedia, since we know there are biographies about notable people there, right? Um, a representation error occurs if some units of your target population have a higher chance of being included in the sample, right? So the question we are asking was um, whether men and women that are captured on Wikipedia are actually equally notable. So we wanted to know whether the same notability criteria are used for deciding you know, whether men, a man or a woman should be captured on Wikipedia or whether maybe women have to be slightly more notable in order to be captured. So in order to answer this question, we have to you know, measure notability, which is uh, quite tricky. So we had to define a couple of proxy measures that we use for um, approximating this concept. So the first proxy measure is an internal proxy. So we are simply using uh, the number of language editions in which a person is captured on Wikipedia as a proxy of global notability. So you can see here from this example that this measure has a certain uh, face validity. So Angela Merkel is clearly um, of global notability. There is an article about her in almost all language editions of Wikipedia. While if you look at you know, local German politicians like Fritz Kuhn, then you would see that there is only an article in the German language edition. 
The second and the third proxy measure that we use uh, comes from Google Trends. So here we are basically looking at the number of months during which we observe a search volume above a predefined threshold from Google. And we are also looking at uh, the number of countries um, from which we observe a search volume above this threshold. So again, you can see that for Angela Merkel, there is a lot of search interest during many months that comes from many countries. And if you compare that with Fritz Kuhn, then you clearly see that the search interest is uh, temporarily and geographically much more focused. So in order to answer these questions, whether uh, men and women that are covered on Wikipedia are equally notable, we uh, fitted three negative binomial regression models. We had our three uh, proxy measures for notability as dependent variables, and we had as independent variables a gender, profession, and birth decade of a person. So from our results, uh, we see that uh, indeed on average, women that are covered on Wikipedia are slightly more notable than their male counterparts. They are covered in 13% more language editions, and they are of interest in more regions and during more months. So we also looked at um, how men and women are presented on Wikipedia, so on a um, lexical level. Um, I think you know, it's uh, quite easy to guess which word cloud belongs to which gender. What we basically did here was we looked at um, the most discriminative uh, features, so words and um, engrams for, as in biographies about men and women, and we ranked them based on the log likelihood ratio, and we coded the top 200 words for each gender. So we used three categories for coding, uh, gender, so words that you know, refer to the gender of a person, relationship status, and family related issues. The reason why we use these three categories is because in gender studies it is quite well known that there are certain aspects in biographies that are emphasized when you look at biographies about women and these are basically the three categories um, that you know previous work suggests are often overemphasized. So in fact, we see that also when we look at Wikipedia, um, if you, you know, look at uh, what is the um, percentage of um, words that fall into these uh, three categories, you see that for women, this is more than one third, while for men, it's only 2.5%. So from that, we clearly see that there is a, a difference in um, how men and women that are notable are presented on Wikipedia. Just to give you here also an example, what are the words that have a higher uh, likelihood of showing up in biographies about women? There are, of course, some things that are not surprising at all. You know, female, woman, madam, husband. I mean, these are all things that are fairly expected. But there are also a couple of uh, more unexpected things, I would say. So for example, you know, being divorced, wedding, marriage. So these are things that have uh, almost four times um, higher likelihood of showing up in biographies about women. So basically, uh, to sum this um, up, um, this shows that there is um, a bias in Wikipedia, a representation error or bias with respect um, to gender. There are differences in the coverage and in how uh, men and women are presented. But of course, there are many more biases, right? There is work that shows that there's geographic bias on Wikipedia, there's topical bias, and there are ethnic biases. So why is this uh, you know, important and relevant and why should we care? So I think on the one hand this is relevant for this community because often these data collections are used to extract uh, knowledge graphs out of it and of course these biases are then also in the knowledge that is extracted. Um, on the other hand, I think it's also important because often we train um, automated methods for measurements on these data collections and if there is a bias here in the data collection, we will have a bias in the measurement. So in the second part, I want to talk, uh, I mean, I want to move a bit deeper into gender bias and talk about sexism. So here now, um, the goal is basically to have a method that automatically measures um, sexist attitudes. Um, and I define sexism simply as any type of prejudice or discrimination um, on a person uh, based on sex or gender. So there are various papers, actually not that many, there are a few papers that specifically try to tackle um, the detection of sexism. I'm just picking now two to you know, give you the basic idea how this works from you know, what I have um, 
seen in papers. So the first one has been published at ACL, is by Wasim and Hovi, and they are actually interested in develop, developing an automated method that you know, detects different types of hate speech, but sexism is one of the categories they are looking at. Um, and the way this works is they are starting you know, with a set of slurs, um, they do some manual search on Twitter, they semi-automatically extend uh, the keyword list that they have, and then they use you know, the final set of keywords to filter down the Twitter API and train their classifier. Another paper that works in a similar way and builds uh, on top of the work of Wasim and Hovi um, is the paper by uh, Ja and Mamidi, and they are, I mean, they are discussing in their paper that they think that the work um, done by Wasim and Hobi is only capturing what they call um, hostile sexism, and therefore they define an additional set of keywords, so nine additional keywords, which they think would help them to learn about benevolent sexism. So both papers are actually nice uh, because they are both using a theory for coding their tweets. So Giant Mamidi used the ambivalent sexism theory by Glick and Fisk, and Vasim and Hovi used the critical race theory by Delgado and Bernal for you know, coding their tweets and deciding on whether something is sexist, hostile sexist, benevolent sexist, or non-sexist. One potential problem I'm still seeing here is that the theory is not really used during the data collection process. That means the theoretical fitting is made post hoc and sometimes is also made ad hoc. And this is something you know, that frequently happens when you look at how classifiers are trained on label data set. Often people you know, go back to you know, theories that relate with a certain construct, but they use it afterwards to label their data. They are not really thinking about the construct while they are um, collecting the data. And um, I want to you know, throw out an idea that is in a very early stage, but we are working on that um, to kind of get our feedback here. So one idea how we could potentially um, avoid this type of measurements errors is exactly by using theory during the data collection process. So the idea is maybe we can um, ensure content validity, which basically means that you capture all aspects of your construct that are relevant by defining a theory-guided data collection process. So how could that work? Well, the idea would be maybe we can you know, reuse valid items from um, service scales and ask people to modify those items with minimal changes to make them invalid in order to produce training samples uh, for a classifier. So what we did is we developed this game that is called Unsexify It, and uh, this game starts uh, with a set of sentences, basically um, around 90 sentences that come from um, sexism scales, so psychological scales, that have been tested. And um, in this game, you are confronted with a, a sentence like, uh, women are generally not as smart as men, and your task is to modify this sentence with minimal lexical changes to make it um, non-sexist. Depending on you know, in which level you are, um, there are certain rules, so we fix uh, certain words like negations or gender identifiers to make it more complex. Um, beside you know, the modification phase, uh, you also um, have a rating phase where you basically rate the modifications of other players. So for example, the sentence, a woman are generally not as uh, smart as men, was transformed into not as tall as men. And then um, the, the players rate the sentences on a Likert scale from uh, one to five, and they can also indicate that the sentence uh, became meaningless. So with this approach, we now have uh, generated for these 90 sentences from the psychological scale around uh, 2,000 modified sentences for which we now know they are you know, very similar to the sexist ones, but they are perceived as non-sexist by the majority um, of um, players. So what are the dimensions of sexism that are now captured in this new test corpus um, that we are collecting? So the dimensions of the scales um, have, or the scales have four different dimensions. One is uh, the endorsement of inequality. So here we have sentences like, the entry of women into traditional male jobs should be discouraged. Then we have uh, sentences that refer to the denial of inequality or the rejection of feminism. So these are sentences like, you know, discrimination against women is no longer a problem in the United States. 
Um, then we have sentences uh, that refer to gender role and gendered behavior. So things like, you know, the, sh the husband should be the head of the family, or it's worse for a woman to get drunk than for a man. And then we have uh, comparative opinions and stereotypes where we have sentences like uh, women have more intuition than men or women are more envious than men. And for all of these you know, four dimensions, we now have positive examples and we have negative examples that are similar. So one thing uh, we tried to do is uh, we implemented the classifiers uh, as described in Chai et al. and Vasim et al. So we basically used their data um, for training and first, of course, um, so I mean, they implemented a couple of classifiers. So simple things like SVM with TF-IDF, uh, fast text, sequence to sequence models, um, and I think logistic regression with some uh, character engrams. Um, so we, we tried all of these methods. Basically, we get similar results. We can reproduce uh, their results, which I think is nice. So if you look, for example, um, I'm just showing you one example. Um, the, the F1 score, when we train on the char data set and we test on the char data set, uh, you know, matches what they say in their paper. Um, if we test on our sexism scale corpus, then we see that the performance of the classifier drops. So this is maybe not surprising because of course, you know, the test data set is very different also, you know, with respect to the type of language that is used and so on. But we also tried to use their data and import it into our game. So we basically sampled from their hostile and benevolent sexism sentences, a couple of them. We also put them in our game and we asked the players to modify those sentences to make them non-sexist. So now we are very close to their data. And even when we do that, we see that the classifier basically totally fails, which I think you know, is some evidence for the fact that the classifier has not really learned a lot about sexism here. Um, just out of curiosity, we also tested uh, the perspective API from Google because uh, though it's a black box and it's not really made for detecting sexism, one of the dimensions that you get from this uh, API uh, is uh, sexism. And um, I mean, Google probably has trained like on a huge data set, so we thought like, let's see, you know, how well this black box does. And you can also see for the perspective scores, uh, the toxicity scores that we get back here, that these scores might help you to distinguish between hostile sexist sentences and non-sexist sentences, but not really between benevolent sexist sentences and non-sexist sentences. And also when you look at the toxicity score for the psychological scales, you see that you know, they match uh, almost perfectly. So also there, um, the, the toxicity score will not help you to differentiate. So to sum this up, I think um, my point here is really that gender bias and sexism is a complex and a multidimensional construct and um, automated methods are needed to detect that. Um, but I think that these methods also need to take the multiple dimensions into account. Um, there are many methods, or some of them, that um, are really good on hostile sexism and slurs. I think that's what fairly easy to automated methods. But then um, the stereotypical beliefs, gender roles, behavior, uh, the denial and endorsement of inequality is much more difficult and is often neglected. And then there is, of course, also the linguistic bias dimension where, you know, one gender is usually used as default, which is also totally uh, neglected by most of the methods. So also for this dimension, we are at the moment uh, putting um, a corpus together based on Wikipedia edits, where editors can make, you know, changes in sentences, for example, you know, change fireman to fire worker, so the typical, you know, gender neutrality changes. And the nice thing is that Wikipedia editors uh, label that, right? They make a comment when they do an edit. So we have actually collected a really nice data set also for this purpose, where we know that uh, sentences were transformed from uh, gendered into to gender neutral. And we are planning to release then, um, you know, this corpus for the different dimensions uh, with the community. So to sum this up, I tried to make three points here that I want to repeat now. So the first one is that I really think uh, often, you know, when we work with multifaceted constructs, we also should think about um, whether we need multiple data collections, right? Or whether the data collection is really capturing the different aspects of the construct we are interested in. I also think that um, we need to think more about the design choices that are made during the data collection process because also if you work with found data, you make a lot of design choices on the way. And I feel like that many of um, you know, the comparison of methods, what works best for detecting stances or this or that, um, is 
tested and evaluated on data sets that do not even describe what design choices were made and to what extent you know, this, this, these choices have introduced errors. And therefore, I find it quite difficult to you know, make uh, from an application point of view an informed decision what method should I use because it's not necessarily true that the method that worked on the three data sets is better than another one because maybe all the three data sets were biased with uh, respect to the construct. And finally, I think you know, maybe you know, thinking about this idea of using theory during the data collection process is uh, useful, especially when we try to learn something about constructs for which we have a theoretical base and for which we know what are actually the aspects, uh, you know, we should capture. With that, I want also to acknowledge uh, my collaborators and I briefly, just like uh, you know, two seconds, want to make an advertisement because just last week we got uh, the notification from the European Commission that our proposal for a Marie Curie Innovative Training Network for um, bias-free AI uh, was accepted. And that means uh, that 15 PhD fellowships in eight European countries will be opened next year. And I'm sure that many of you have access to very talented master students. That's why I want to point this out. If you know anyone who could be interested, please uh, you know, tell them they should just email me. I'm very happy to give more information on that as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It was very interesting, very different, and very mind-blowing. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, so if you want to study sexism and sexism in language and sexism in any kind of like data collection, would maybe a knowledge base help you, or a knowledge, especially kind of constructed sexism knowledge base, and how would that look like, or do you think, well, we haven't fully understood how sexism manifests in all these different dimensions. We are not at the point yet where we can say these are the indicators that we need to know. Yeah. No, I mean, I think uh, it would help. Like, the question is for what exactly, right? Maybe not for all dimensions, but I think a knowledge base or any automated method would help me if. Uh, on top of the method, I would also get information on how exactly it was um, extracted from what corpus, what biases are in the corpus, and so on, right? Because I think just, I mean, there are a couple of taxonomies on hate speech and this kind of uh, stuff out there, right? But also there, if I don't understand what is exactly um, the biases and how this was constructed, then I'm not really sure if this is then very useful. I mean, I think you can also use then this black box tools, but I think then you would need to have a test data set for which you know that it was constructed in a way that is in line with the construct, and then you can test the knowledge base against that, right? If that answers your question, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Thank you, that was really interesting. I was just wondering, when you were talking about biographies and how women are described, this is something I actually noticed in biographies of women who write their own biographies. Mm. So how much is the bias, I mean, um, totally, yeah. there is bias, how much of it is self-inflicted? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I was, you know, consciously not uh, saying anything about that the Wikipedia editor community is the source of the bias because this claim is often made, right? They are mainly male, they are around their 30s, they are highly educated and so on. So it's a very specific group that writes Wikipedia, we know that, and at the same time we know that there is a bias. But I think the connection between that, you know, the source of the bias are, you know, the non-diverse demographics of the Wikipedia editor community, I mean, we cannot really make this. There is a lot of evidence also when it comes to hiring processes where you know people observe uh, discrimination against minorities um, that you know women would be as um, um, as uh, biased as men right so it's not necessarily an in-group out-group bias but I think it's a societal bias yeah <laughs> 